Massive thank you as always to our top tier patrons, Sarah Turner and Alexander Lashley. It's Not Just In Your Head is hosted by psychotherapist Dr. Harriet Fraud, addiction and substance misuse disorder counsellor Ekoi Hero, and myself, editor and producer Liam Tate. This podcast is entirely funded by listeners, and as the famous meme states, we are critiquing capitalism because we are forced to participate in it in order to survive. So, if you can afford to support the podcast, then your contribution will ensure that we can keep making this show. However, if you can't, then please just tell your friends about us, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and follow us on social Social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, and YouTube. This week, we're joined by Jonathan Crary, author of Scorched Earth, Beyond the Digital Age to a Post-Capitalist World. Jonathan Crary is an art critic and essayist and is Maya Shapiro Professor of Modern Art and Theory at Columbia University. In this episode, we cover topics like EMDR and consumer eye tracking, the need to refuse and resist certain technologies, the consequences of leaving supposedly smart people to figure things out for us, and the multifaceted meaning of a scorched earth. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. Like the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. I'm going to start with a quote you have. The internet complex is the implacable engine of addiction, loneliness, false hopes, cruelty, psychosis, indebtedness, squandered life, the corrosion of memory, and social disintegration. Uh, yeah, the book reads like a sort of a machine gun to the internet and digital culture. I think the only thing maybe you've missed in that is cat videos and memes. But, you know, maybe that's what we've, <laughs> we, we've, we've traded in for the stuff that you've observed. And maybe as an opening question, uh, you make a point that, you know, the internet hasn't really furthered any anti-capitalist or anti-war movements at all. There's not even minor success uh, in any of that stuff. Is it a case that... It's just one of those things that hasn't happened yet, or is there something sort of integral about the way it's built or the infrastructure that just means it never will? Well, it's interesting because I um, I actually finished writing the book just as the pandemic was beginning. I finished it in early 2020, and I held on to it for a while. I didn't want to send it off to my publisher with this, you know, not really knowing <laughs> where the pandemic was going. And I said, I don't really want, and I talked to other writers, authors who said the same thing. They didn't really want their book to come out in a lockdown or whatever. The The book really reflects my assessment or my response to what I was seeing up to that point. And it's interesting that I see things that I mapped out or or noted in, in, in some form or another as, as accelerating or, or getting worse. I mean, just to put it very simply. Hmm. Um, so I'm even more pessimistic now about using network technology for any large scale set of social transformations. I, you know, obviously there, we use it. We, there are all, there are all sorts of local things that we do that we depend on for it. But I'm really thinking in the way in which, in a sense, it's, it's not available as something that could work in some long term sustained form of struggle um, or struggles that are taking place on interconnected um, levels. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I've, I, I think has become clear to so many people since then, I mean, it's just in the last two, three years, is the intensification of forms of, 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 of corporate institutional and state control over how it's used. Um, and in a sense, the acquiescence of so many people to some of the, those some of those developments. So I, there's a, there's a point in the book where I talk about the mid 1990s, which you know the, you know many people see the the mid 1990s as the moment when the the kind of mass availability of of the internet begins. Obviously, we can go back much earlier than that. But what I what I briefly sort of suggest is that since the, since the mid 1990s, there's been a, a, an inexorable assimilation and appropriation of that technology into the needs and requirements of, of powerful institutions. That that fantasy that it was somehow going to be this horizontal, democratic, leveled field, um, it, it wasn't ever going to happen um, as far as I, as I can see. Yeah, it's fascinating because we had a, a brief discussion with one of the patrons that's on the discord and they were talking about that early 2000s late 90s 
version of the internet for them was a space where they did find some kind of freedom because although certain progress had been made in in real life in terms of uh, civil rights stuff or sexuality things in his real life he wasn't able to really be who he was and so the internet allowed him to connect with other people and have a sense of almost social status i guess or just like freedom and i wonder mm-hmm. if that has if that still exists for people or whether that has that was just you know you were lucky because <laughs> at that point in time the internet hadn't been sort of formalized in a sort of corporate manner and now we're living in a different i don't know if you have any sort of thoughts or reflections on that idea well i mean the, the, one of the things about my book is that i i made the choice to write what i am referring to in, in one form or another as a pamphlet so in, in a sense, I renounced the idea of writing a kind of objective analysis <laughs> of, right. uh, of, of contemporary technologies. In other words, I see, and I, I can't really quantify it, but every month I see hundreds of books. I mean, maybe I'm wrong in how I'm quantifying. I, I sometimes I see thousands. But just in the last 10 years, there's just been a, a tidal wave of books about how we use social media, how we use the internet, that in one way or another are critical. Um, that say, oh, we're, you know, that we're we're being, you know, harmed in this and that way. This is not working. You know, our children are being this and that. But I would say, I mean, what my frustration with that massive amount of of apparent critical evaluations of the assessment is the the uniformity and the, the inevitability that they all presume the underlying inevitability and necessity of of the technology that we're using. So I was not going to do that. I wanted to write a book that would, in a sense, shake people to at least think of 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 what it would mean to move beyond the the kind of institutional technological era that we're in. I mean I I I was mentioning the intensification of forms of 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 institutional control over social media and the way we use the internet but that's not that's only one aspect of the kind of critique that i wanted to put forward and I'm, I'm, you know whether i was successful or not but I, I i wanted at the same time to put forward a kind of what i i call as a, a, an ethical slash aesthetic critique of the way you know the, i mean you talked about how you know there were people who got a sensation of connectedness and freedom and so on i i find those experiences ultimately to be secondary to the larger kind of damage that has taken place over the last 20 years in in terms of and this is kind of what i do in that last chapter of the book um, I, I talk about the way in which we perceive the world and the way in which we perceive others is is diminished in a way that damages. I don't want to say that it excludes the possibility, but I think it really makes necessary forms of social solidarity um, in, increasingly difficult. Yeah, lo- there was uh, losing the ability to see or listen to others to partake in some kind of basic social exchange right. and, you know and there are tons of people who've responded to the book kind of very with real hostility saying oh you know you're being too sentimental this is you know you're anti-modern you're this you're that you know who feel that that form of 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 a of a critique of the very shaping of experience is um is irrelevant um people will say oh we have all these new forms of of connecting and relating and you know there's actually this the brilliant point you make, which is this idea of like that there is this sort of threat of uh, all seeing mass surveillance. Um, the, the problem being that for that sort of authority to exist, you need a certain kind of stability and that all of this technology is falling apart all of the time and capitalism is constantly refreshing <laughs> and updating all the software and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff because of that constant need to um, churn through things. And that, that was, I had never considered that as a, as a, as a conflict. And, you know, again, it comes back to sort of Mark Fisher's idea of crap robots. Yeah, that maybe that is slightly overblown, this sort of fear of mass surveillance because, because of the upkeep they require. Well, I mean, I don't want to, I, I'm not asserting that it's not a problem because uh, obviously people should have some, some kind of security from those processes. But what I was trying to emphasize is that very few people point out 
the ways in which that obsession with with privacy in many ways simply reinforces the kind of separateness, the kind of individualization that is totally compatible with the, 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 the smooth functioning of the system, minus the idea of, of data mining. And one of the things that I try to, to make clear in that last chapter, where I talk about eye tracking and emotion recognition, that many people, they, they read about eye tracking or, or other, other recognition technologies, and, and they assume that it's to spy on, them, on, the, on, on someone individually. And, you know, in some cases that, that may be true, but in general, those technologies of, of eye tracking, emotion recognition, other, other forms, it's to determine regularities, if I can use that word. I mean, Foucault used that word. You know, you look at what's taking place over a large scale. So they're not interested in, in, in what, a, what a single individual is looking at on the Internet. But by looking at, you know, millions of, of instances, they're able to find those regularities that are most compatible with whatever the goals, the financial goals, the sales goals, whatever. So I'm talking about the, 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 the transformation of the visual online spaces um, or images that we look at and, and the way in which they are, they are defined by that kind of surveillance. So it doesn't really matter if, if, if I've ever been eye tracked or not, but I'm what, what we spend all day online, um, engaging with our, 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 our visual milieus or visual environments that, um, in a sense are dumbed down and, and, and in a sense are constructed to, to facilitate one's engagement, you know, to get you to not spend too long on any one web page, to move on, to you know, to so it's 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 that it's also the the accumulation of information about scrolling patterns, about clicks, all you know, all of that. So so what what I was trying to do was to at least reframe some of the the concerns about what what I what's called biometrics. Which I, I see, I see the damage being done in 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 all sorts of ways, and probably, you know, I end up talking about the face and about the the degradation um, of of the human face. One of the things that struck me listening to the aspect of you know eye movement is uh, one that has kind of links to therapy in EMDR, right, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Uh, which is a psychotherapist th therapy treatment to um, alleviate traumatic memories and the distress that uh, come from trauma. That chapter was really interesting for me on, on various levels, but I was sitting there thinking like, oh yeah, like in terms of eye movement tracking being about like the metadata rather than like the individual data. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the eye movement, like I was like, oh, I can totally see how these data can like these eye movement data can then, you know, kind of frame, you know, moving parts, for example, on like a website to elicit certain impact. I mean, like a huge part of the consumer, quote unquote, addiction, right, um, that we have in our society is consumerism is soothing, you know, to to the distress of, of modern life and kind of how like retail sites could really utilize this information to make that even more, quote unquote, like soothing. If mm -hmm. You get my drift. You know, one of the layers. You know, it's a it's a short book, and a, a lot of what I do is 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 in a sense briefly telegraphing some of what I see as as crucial issues, um, it, without going into a, a multi page or or chapter length um, discussion. Um, so there's a, there's a lot that I that I map out um, that um, for better or for worse, um, I, I have those. In, in a sense, these the, these relatively brief, but I but I hope concentrated announcements of of what I see as as significant problems, and you know, so there is a layer of the book that's about climate change, that's about the the destruction of the, the Earth system, if we can use that that term. I, I, I think that estrangement of, of perception on a, on a, on a mass level. In other words, of the, um, the, the ways in which our perceptual capabilities of engaging with what, what we could call a living world is, um, 
becoming um, a, a, an increasingly serious problem. And a lot of people don't agree. They just say, oh, you know, the, the Internet makes available. There's all this information about, you know, all these different strategies for ameliorating climate change. But I, I, I'm not convinced. I mean, I, I really feel that distance that people have from the different interconnected parts of a planetary system, um, it, it completely destroys that firsthand awareness. I mean, obviously, sort of abstractly, we 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 know about these things, but I don't. I, I think if there's not that that lived experience of what a life world is, and that's a term I use n- a number of times in the book. So that that whole idea of our perceptual capabilities being being damaged or eroded for for me is is, is really crucial. You know, I'm try- I, one of the things I did in the book is to use the names of thinkers and writers who, in one way or another, were important for me. A lot of What's there are not my original ideas. And so I wanted to make it clear that I'm drawing on a, you know, on a really rich accumulation of, of, of work. I, I thought, you know, one of your observations as well is, is the language. There's a sort of trickery that happens with a lot of this digital uh, stuff like the cloud or virtual reality. You make this point that it, it sounds like it doesn't really have any kind of solid place on the earth. It's just this sort of mm-hmm. immaterial <laughs> uh, sort of fancy thing that is just out there. But again, you know, tying it back to that environmental stuff, there is, you know, and this sort of ties to the title of the book as well, just that all this uh, digital infrastructure requires land it requires resources uh you know whether that's sort of mining for the uh precious kind of metals or maintaining the servers and yeah the what was your the definition of scorched earth reduced to a state of bareness and of lost capacity for regeneration now that's the sort of physical environment but the 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 human side of this is that there's this idea that by being completely engulfed by these systems day to day that we sort of lose our ability to work with other people or like you say like look someone else in the face or somehow uh, work through difficult situations Um, and obviously as equates as a therapist you sort of experiencing people in 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 distress and so it's sort of like a heightened version um maybe of of sort of day-to-day interactions but I was just wondering if it, actually I was wondering really if Ekoi, have you noticed anything over any time period? Uh, is there any been sort of any correlation for you with with uh, um, clients with sort of addictive episodes and and technology? Is there sort of is there anything that sort of comes to mind? I remember a much older client kind of making this uh, offhand joke that like, man, like kids have it easy these days. Like in order for me to score drugs, I used to have to do a lot more legwork. <laughs> right, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like with the internet, like, you know, and, and all these, you know, technologies, right? You've got like, you know, 25 dealers that you can just send a mass text too right? right or people say the same thing about people my age say the same thing about dating they say oh my god what would my life have been like if i'd been able to use the internet to meet people dating <laughs> one of the things that you mentioned you know about like synth Synthetic color becomes allied with techniques of attraction, solicitation, and persuasion. Um, I, I yeah, this is somebody that once used to do a lot of artwork. That part was really interesting, but it's one of those things where that part struck out to me in a sense of how like this bombardment of constant, you know, color and excess desensitizes you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. In really real ways. And it just, I, I remember, you know, an earlier, back to an earlier life when I was listening to this one famous uh, Japanese artist talk about how important it was to use paints that weren't just synthetic to fully grasp the subtlety of color. Well, very, very good point. Yeah. You know, just even talking to people about watching the artwork and watching things like film, 
of how much CG has kind of dulled filmmaking rather than improved the quality of it in many ways. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. That there's just been a kind of um, tidal wave of, of 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 mediocre what's what what they call content, you know, of of all of these services that that continually need new uh, new content for people to be uh, binge watching <laughs> on a daily basis. Um, but just to go back to the title of the book, Scorched Earth. I mean, you know, you're right. I I wanted that phrase, that familiar phrase, to to operate on several different plateaus and and clearly what i wanted to insist upon is that we we can talk about a scorched earth in terms of the the damage to communities um and 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 the destruction of 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 what resources and i mean resources in terms of of social and and human resources make sustaining those communities possible um so there's there's a parallel um deterioration of a of a physical world at the same time that there's a breakdown of civil society and here i know that's a kind of loaded term but i'm i'm, I'm just using it for the for those institutions in a, in any given society that in a sense are 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 separate from the marketplace um from a from a from a calculus of 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 profit or gain and um you know what what we've just seen over the last 20 years is this relentless relocation of experiences or exchanges that used to be part of a of a social or communal environment of relocating them to to different uh digital or, or networked forms so that there re there really has been this hollowing out of of what was able to hold communities together in 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 many ways. I mean that's you know so a lot of people have said that I'm wrong to to say that uh, you know to, when I sort of criticize the whole rhetoric around the digital divide, you know the idea that oh if we get everybody online, you know it's going to uplift everyone and and clearly that's not happening. Um you know there there may be some benefits but they're completely overridden by the the, the the insistence that everyone be a consumer of 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 online of online goods products and 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 experiences there was just a funny bit where you were talking about tech literacy is a euphemism for shopping and addiction <laughs> right <laughs> but in a, in a certain way it is that that's 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 the primary uh, you know functions and and skills that um that people use over and over again um and 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 the way in which you know one's 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 online existence in in most cases becomes reduced to um a a, a relatively barren set of of repetitive routines right when when i finished the book right before the pandemic began i actually thought about maybe a I should add something to the book about social media and Zoom and, you know, of, of what was happening during the pandemic. And I started to do that and I, I realized it, was, it wasn't working. I kind of was messing up what I what, what actually was a pretty well-balanced argument. And so, I you know, I stuck with the text uh, as it was in, in, in 2020. Um, but I, again, I, I, I see so much of the aftermath of, of, I mean, of what happened to people by spending um, so much time. I mean, I just saw in a very direct way what happened to a lot of my students um, or students of my colleagues uh, here um, of the kind of emotional difficulties of being cut off from those relationships that had previously taken place in, in physical space or taken place face to face and, and just to go back you know we all know i mean you know anyone who spends time online and, and and has some sort of intelligent relationship to what's being presented about climate change and about sustainability and so on most people know that there are extractive processes that bring the different materials that 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 make possible all of the components of what I call the internet complex. Yet what I find is a pervasive kind of lazy assumption. Well, they'll figure out a solution to do these extractive processes that won't cause harm to the 
indigenous peoples or to the environments in these places, mostly in the global south, not all. And it, it it's that's it, it's precisely that estrangement of those of us in North America, Europe, and, and other places where there is that kind of bad faith, because th- there's also a level that people may not even admit to themselves that they know that's not really going to happen. And it never has happened. So I, you know, I give a few instances of, of the, the scale of the, of the destruction to, to different environments, whether it's in Southeast Asia, whether it's in Latin America. Well, also the parallel sort of examples of um, scientists working on behalf of uh, corporations and that they're, what they have to show for their efforts is all rainwater in the world is now <laughs> contaminated forever. Uh, mm-hmm. and, with and, the forever chemicals. Yeah, yeah, with the forever chemicals. So like exactly what you're saying, this idea that we can just lean on a bunch of smart people, quote unquote, to just fix everything is is kind of insane and that there is a certain kind of power in our hands if we choose if we choose to use it to push back against uh, a lot of this stuff. And, and I think really it just starts with questioning the authority of um, assumptions that are made in, in our culture. And I think your book is doing that. I think it's, you know, a very sort of loud pushback on a lot of uh, things that are taken for granted. I think one of the important aspects of this book is like, regardless of one's individual experience of the internet, Mm -hmm. You know, as somebody that's had where I would say like the Internet has had some fairly important positive impact in my life, I can still read the text and understand, you know, the systemic damage. Yeah, no, that's 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 a very good way to put it. And and the systemic mendaciousness Mm -hmm. of those that are controlling these (laughs) <laughs> these entities, right? And and also the, the real costs, the real environmental costs in general of technology. Personal benefits can't be used to kind of like wave away those real concerns because ultimately, you know, you, you mentioned the prey predator type of dynamic. And that's exactly kind of what it is, is that all these technologies that are facilitated by the connectedness of the internet is basically making us prey. Right. And part of that bombardment is desensitizing us, whether it's to our thoughts, whether it's to our relationships, or even our feelings. You know, you're very much pointing towards connecting with other people. You know, there's quotes like, this is a world that's no longer shared. There is a fear of anything communal, but it but it's that whole idea that you're sort of directing um, or you're pointing towards that this is where the atrophy is happening, a- mm-hmm. and the and or a culture is pushing people in a certain way, which is just think about yourself, you know, like Ecoy's point just about sort of zooming out and seeing this sort of systemic stuff. This idea of just focusing on your needs and not the collective. So I think you know you were talking about the USA had like a um, freedom from responsibility for others, right? That was <laughs> yeah. one of your sort of critiques. And I think you make the point that it's, in one way that this ex- this is expressed in real life is when you are out in real life in maybe even in some social situation and everyone's just staring at their phone and it's just a complete rejection of, I have I don't have any responsibility to anyone else here mm-hmm. um, and I don't want to connect with anyone else. Um and that is, you know, is scary. Right. Well, and I think a huge, you know, the internet kind of gives us like this vast illusion of choice and right. options, right? That that aren't necessarily um, material or tangible. And I think that's part of the huge aspect of of alienation is that you don't commit to anything. I, I may not have made the point as strongly as I could have, but I, I, I I'm convinced of that compatibility of the internet complex with some distinctly American character formation, so to speak, which which you were just discussing, of that idea of, of, of the, the value that's placed on individual autonomy and that freeing up of responsibility for others. And obviously, those um, those tendencies go back 
way, way um, before um, the the 1990s. Um, and in fact, some people would push it push it even further back. But I think just to go back a little bit to to what um, was was said, what what the what the internet complex has done, and I'm this is especially what I observe in here in North America. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm less confident making sort of generalizations that are sort of global, but that it's it, in a sense it provides this cocoon um, within which life and interactions take place that that it, that it, it increasingly becomes naturalized to the point where there's an inability to, in a sense, acknowledge what is outside that that bubble, that that cocoon. And you know, 24 hours a day, we're bombarded with with images and um, constructions of how life should be lived that um, that, 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 that amplify, all of of those those tendencies and you know for me what's missing is the capacity for refusal so that that the 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 kind of the the kind of complicity that you know i don't i don't want to exempt myself from it either but it's just there's there's a way in which we we've accepted the terms of this dramatically impoverished form of existence, you know, regardless of all of the, the kind of benefits of convenience or or whatever that supposedly go along with it. So it's it's that capacity for refusal that uh, I'm, I'm I'm trying to to get in touch with, you know. And obviously, some other words would be would be the idea of of revolt, um, which a number of thinkers who I admire greatly, they you know. So I'm hardly the only person to say that, um, but I, I make that statement. I say there are no revolutionary subjects on social media. You know, I, but it, it was really it's there as, as a provocation. You know, whether it's literally true, that's not the point. But I mean, I you know I'm someone who goes back to the to the very early '70s. I was completely immersed in the, the anti-war movement, but but specifically in the anti-imperialist wing of of the anti-war movement then i was part of of several different um revolutionary communities um here here in the new york area so that in in a sense that's part of my my background my framework that's kind of been marginalized and submerged in various ways during my my long time in academia but it's it's funny when i with writing 24 7 which you know i don't know whether you're familiar with that Book or not, but that was that was when I realized that I, I, I needed to move away from academic prose that was really directed to to, to other people in my field. Um, even even though the books that I had um, had reached um, wider audiences, but I, it's kind of like that realization of 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 living at a moment of crisis. I mean, it sounds kind of cliched, but you know. <laughs> If if we can't accept that right now is a is a kind of terminal state of emergency, um, I, I don't know what would be. So you know, part of what I wanted to do was to do something e- exemplary. I'm no longer writing uh, books about some of my specialized expertise and in, in different fields. Um, and so I'm hoping to participate in in just as we're doing now, which is terrific. You know, a, a, a participating in conversations with with relatively like minded groups and peoples and communities. Yeah, and I think that you just said earlier, just the idea that uh, we've all just sort of magically accepted the terms of this version of uh, the present or or the future. And you make the point that uh, these labels like Gen X and whatever, um, the quote is like invented by pseudo sociology to define the homogenous consumerist tasks that are intended as an inescapable mass destiny. And Mm -hmm. that perfectly fits with a later quote when you're talking about a scorched earth is the stifling of hope, the canceling of the possibility that the world could be restored or healed, or, you know, that there could be some different, there could be something different (laughs) other than, um, you know, Hey, buy these, uh, products. One of the things that I started out with when I was putting the book together was, was the, the various claims that are, you know, sometimes implicit or, but, you know, often explicit as well, is that 
the, all of the digital technologies and networks that we use was the, was the affirmation that they are here to stay. So just those three words, um, here to stay, that, that for me, in a, in a sense, are bound up in some of the, the language that we associate with neoliberalism, if we still want to use that word, um, of, of kind of that Margaret Thatcher, um, what was her phrase? There is no alternative hmm. to a kind of global market economy, T-I-N-A. Um, so it, I, I saw some of the same things happening with these digital tools that we're supposedly, you know, gifted. I mean, we're, 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 we should be grateful to have. Um, so it was what I wanted to shake up was th that that claim of, of that this is all here to stay. Um, as though this, this kind of global interconnected world is, is, is here to stay. And clearly, <laughs> the other thing that's happened, especially in the last year, is the you know, the complete destabilization of that fantasy. I mean, you know, with all of the repercussions from the war in the Ukraine um, and the, you know, the, the, the increasing split between Russia, China on one hand and, and Europe and, and North America on the other, you know, so that the, the, it's just a window onto how unstable all of those fantasies of a smooth, frictionless, interconnected global world, you know, that the, the whole breakdown of supply chains is, is just another one of many um, places where that, that, that fantasy is, um, is, is breaking down. Um, and, and, on a, and on a social level, I think it, it's even more dramatic, especially here in the U.S., um, and I'm really, I'm, I'm just referring to, you know, the, of, of the way in which we've, we've almost become, I'm not really sure how to put this, but the prevalence of, of the mass shootings, that there's, there's a way in which we're not really yet authorized to, 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 to proclaim how deranged this society in, in, in fact is, that not only does that violence happen, but that it, in, in a sense, it's, it's institutionally tolerated and that we're all having to somehow factor we're, we're all having to somehow acclimatize ourselves to the inevitability of these you know what i the word i use is sociocidal events that occur with such regularity this is the society that is disintegrating and you know no one wants to hear that oh can't you give us something more hopeful but maybe there's is you know you need you, you need certain forms of disintegration before um, there can be the real implantation of of, of more re regenerative and, and nurturing forms of connecting with each other. Oftentimes when people say, can't you give us something more hopeful? That hopeful, it, it becomes a kind of synonym for something that will allow the, con the continuation of our, our current complacency or our, 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 our current embeddedness in the way things are now. Um, so it's a, you know it's a tough balance. I mean, I, you know, all these people who are working in, in, in climate change movements, you know, there's all these debates about if you're too pessimistic, you're gonna, I don't know, you you, you won't be able to mobilize people. So I'm I'm not sure where I really end up on on that debate, but I I just think that being honest, that being candid about what's really happening is you know. The, there's no alternative to that. Yeah, you have to correctly understand what the problem is before you can um, have the solution. And I, there's a couple of quotes I want to link up to the stuff that you just said. A marker of terminal capitalism is the absence of any substantive or credible promise of a better future. And our future is very much being sort of curated uh, by a small number of corporations, which you, yeah, you make the excellent the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, and then you make it. There's a, just it actually blew my mind. You. You said the gun redeems the hollowness of a material culture that produces powerlessness and disappointment. Now, obviously, you're not like, yay, let's shoot people. <laughs> but but you make the point that like the gun is like the one thing you can buy that actually does something, even though it might do something horrific. Or at least that's how I read it. 
And so uh, to my mind, tying these things together is like, we live in a system that doesn't promise anything better in the future, really, or that, that's tangible. There's a sense of despair. People are being sort of shown the good life on their screens, but it's not materializing. And then there, there's all these kind of mental health problems that come from not having stable housing or like good wages or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. And the gun then turns up as this thing. You know, a gun is then mm -hmm. one of those things. Well, and, and again, it's, it's something that has a specifically American underpinning that, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't really feel competent to, to expound on that, that further, but I, it's, it's an intuition that I think I, I share with, with, with many other people so that you look around the world and there is something, the pathology in this country is the, the, there's something unique um, uh, about it. The only freedom that's guaranteed in modern capitalist society, especially ones like the United States, is the freedom towards destitution. Right. <laughs> Right. right. And so it makes sense. I mean, especially having grown up uh, a little bit in gun culture in, in the South um, that I mean, it at, uh, on one hand, it is the only kind of sanctioned weapon of fate in our culture in a certain way. Right. Where like it's like, you know, we can't guarantee you the good thing. But we will give you this tool where you can either off yourself or off others. Yes, yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely. That's a frightening way to to, to put it. I mean, it's, but 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 true. You know, I mean, I'm putting together what, what will be another book. Um, I'm not totally sure what direction it's it's going to go. But one of the things I am doing a lot of reading in and thinking about are some of the very positive initiatives that are taking place, not so much in the US, but in, 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 in Europe and in Latin America and other parts of the global South, you know, that loosely come together un, under, I mean, in, in Spanish, the, the phrase is buen vivir, you know, better living, which is these different movements that some in Bolivia, some in Ecuador, and that have been taken up in, in a number of other our countries as well of, of, of developing that idea that communities can can come together to provide a sustainable existence that's based on interdependence between between humans, but also interdependence between people and the regional and local environments they have. You know, they're, they're also movements that are organized around the idea of conviviality, the, the number of places, um, you know, then there's also what's come to be called uh, Southern thought, um, the, the whole idea that some of these related forms of thinking about interdependence and sustainability are are, are, are recoverable from many, many, many centuries of, of, of alternate practices that are that are alien to what's going on in Europe and, and North America. But I, but what I, I, I really see the U.S. As, as, as in a sense incapable of assimilating some of those models of, of interdependence. Or, I mean, I, it's really hard for me to, to see um, some of those ideas taking root here. In, in, I mean, it's, you know, I could be wrong. It is, it is difficult. I think you're absolutely right in in the difficulty, you know, because one, I mean, even in terms of mental health treatment and therapy, especially in areas like substance use disorder treatment, you know, there is this tendency of kind of leaving people behind as a very justified way of getting ahead. You mean you're talking about something that is distinctly American? Right. You know, I mean, it's one of those things where I don't hear this nearly as much. I haven't talked to people in like mental health and therapy and counseling in other countries to be mm -hmm. able to speak, you know, with like full sanguine confidence on these things. But yeah, it, it's so common for, um, you know, in substance use disorder treatment to kind of give this blanket statement of like, if you're trying to get over drugs, you know, you should basically just stop talking to everyone in your life that uses, uh -huh. you know, and it's one of those things where it's like on one hand, you know, could that be beneficial on an individual level? Surely. Right. But on another hand, that 
is an extraordinarily ruthless statement to make as a general suggestion. Yeah, lose all your friends. Mm -hmm. Lose your friends, your family, your, you know, your social ties, your everything. Yeah, and to a certain degree, that's also what we experience out of people that leave poverty. If you start doing well for yourself, you know, what do most people do? Like they move out of their old neighborhood into better and better neighborhoods, mm-hmm. right? As they move up in, in the socioeconomic mm-hmm. scale. Right. No, I mean, that's what a lot of people forget is that whole notion of what the cliche of, of the American dream, that it's about arriving at a social, certain social status that's better than those of the people who you came up with or were, were you know, it's, 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 it's a, the American dream is inherently competitive. Um, right. And that when someone sustains it, it's, it, it's about that, you know, totally fraudulent notion of, 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 of some sort of fulfillment, but it's, it's, it's simply, you know, part of the, the mechanisms that goad people into, accumulation and, 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 you know, basically stoke forms of greed, whether it's greed for money or whether it's greed for symbolic capital. Um, right. In all the ways in which that's been, been part of, of America. I mean, I just, you know, just a kind of footnote to talking about the U S and my book, um, the Spanish translation of scorched earth came out um, in Spain well, actually, it's a, it's a global Spanish, right? So it's Latin America and Spain. And I, I was surprised at how different the media response was to the book from the English language edition. In other words, there was there was kind of receptivity at at, at many different levels, you know, including you know several of the major news outlets, you know, the, the newspaper El País reproduced an excerpt, um, part of one chapter in their Sunday magazine section. That was not going to happen with the New York Times, you know, or, or like The Guardian in England. It, you know, they, they actually reviewed um, 24-7. They didn't touch Scorched Earth. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting that, I mean, I, I was talking about that whole idea of of Southern thought. And, you know, Spain is one of the places that's looked at as in, in which there, there are persistences of some of the older ways in which neighborhoods and communities uh, survive. So that was, that was kind of reassuring to me to see um, th- there's a differentiated way in, in, in which different um, media regimes um, can respond. Um, and just in terms of a kind of intuition about the, the, about their readership, so to speak. Recently did this episode uh, with this uh, lady who, who's written a book about emotions and how different you know, cultures um, conceptualize emotions differently and how in individualistic cultures you situate the emotion as an essence that it's inside you and more collectivist cultures see it as a sort of social uh, thing that exists between people. Mm-hmm. And so if, you know, if all that stuff is true, then it does frame things in a in a certain kind of way where you go okay well if you have a very individualistic culture it probably is very difficult to go hey you know there's some benefits to um sort of collective organizing or stuff like that um you can see that if it's sort of in the you know embedded in the culture that it it becomes maybe a bit of an uphill struggle trying to get other people to see the world in a different way so like you say you're sort of dealing with history and uh, different countries, um, cultures. Like I know in like certain Scandinavian countries, they have this John Tay's law, which basically means you're nothing special, <laughs> which in America I can imagine wouldn't go down well at all. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. Well, even though that's, that, that's, that in fact is the message from the, the billionaire culture that we live in. Um, there, there are all of these completely, duplicitous ways of, of affirming the value of an individual where, where in fact, the, the reality of the system that we live in is, is just the contemptuousness uh, for the fate of, 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 of the individual. Right, yeah, and that's part of the crazy-making stuff as well, isn't it? On one hand, you're told it's about achieving this thing and sort of self-actualizing in a particular kind of way. Meanwhile, everything else is sort of conspiring against you for that to 
never happen, <laughs> um, right. which is kind of cruel. And it, it struck me as well that, that you had this brilliant bit where you're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And I was like, wow, this is uh, you, you've, what you've described is completely factual, but completely resonates with 5G conspiracy theorists, right? Which is that, the, you know, these 5G towers are all causing COVID and, you know, it's all about elite control and blah, blah, blah. But you, you were making the point that, hey, you know, the electromagnetic electromagnetic spectrum uh beyond visible light there's the stuff all around us the radio waves the wi-fi etc 5g that is um all part of this infrastructure uh that we're all sort of plugged into um that's invisible and is is part of uh the sort of stratification of society and i was like yeah that is a fascinating uh insight into like a lot of these conspiracy theories they have an impulse that is correct, but then they just go off the deep end. No, no, I was I was trying to make the point that, that you know, to to get away from the standard ways in which high school students are taught about science, as though they're that scientific discoveries are are the result of the you know of the genius or the, the independent experimentation of these brilliant people. Whereas what I you know briefly noted was how the no the, the, these these were discoveries that came out of um of, of a kind of institutional a complex um that was very much part of 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 global the configuration of of of, of global national and powerful ambitions at the end of the 19th and early 20th century that ultimately culminated in the invention of, of atomic weapons and 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 of the communication systems on which powerful institutions depend um, and militaries you know obviously you know as, as you know, Paul Virilio and McLuhan and so many others you know every military technology ultimately always has side benefits for consumers and civilians so to speak but one thing about these types of critiques is that you know it kind of pulls very diverse ideas together you know in in ways that you never would have like necessarily connected right like i never would have thought about like paint colors mm -hmm. and the internet you know but you make a very good case for the um synthetic pigments and and the well, and also how the how the eye works right like the yeah. bit where you're explaining like during the day essentially we have color and then during nighttime, you know, our eyes don't really work so well with color. Mm -hmm. And just that idea, I'd never even thought like, yeah, nighttime is kind of black and white. <laughs> and then, you know, morning is uh, is the beginning of color. And just that, that sensitivity, uh, you know, because I've grown up with, you know, TVs and <laughs> screens, um, nighttime well, is, doesn't that's exist. That's a link back to my, my book 24-7, um, where what I, what I was trying to do in, in that book was to look at some of the consequences of the the abandonment of a world and of of social patterns that that were grounded in those cyclical rhythms you know whether it's of day to night i mean it's just the the way in which we were attuned to 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 having those experiences just be this core part of our lives or or, or of the seasons of the year um um, and, and and many other patterns that that were based on those those, those those cyclical experiences that were common to everyone. So I you know I talked about twenty four seven as this very very recent experience of temporality that um, in, increasingly was was uprooting people from those those long standing patterns. Um, and, and of, of the of the the routines that sustained communities through the repetition of those seasonal or diurnal rhythms. So, then, in, in, in a sense, the homogenization of experience. Um, but also, it was a book that used sleep um, as this, you know, sort of intrinsic, you know, sort of kind of irreducible human experience of, of the way in which sleep was being made into something not, not literally expendable, but of, 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 of having that interval of, in a sense, of withdrawal and restoration of, in, 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 a, in a sense, kind of 
diminishing the significance of that of that interval with all of the injury that 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 accompanied that that set of changes. So part of what's at stake is just how recent all these changes are. You know, that, so that's why that whole thing about the the electromagnetic spectrum, the, 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 just the few decades in which that emerged, you know, or or talking about artificial color. And, and the other thing that I mentioned a couple of times is, you know, it's related to color is just the phenomena of, of what I call electroluminescence or what, you know, what that's just a term for the form of, of, of illumination that most screens um, emit. So that obviously we look at color on our screens, but it's, it's again, it's that estrangement from the, the, the sensitivity to see the, the, the nuances and subtleties of color in a, in a living world, whether it's on birds, whether it's on animals, whether it's on plants, whether it's on vegetation. I mean, most, most people simply are, are, their sensibilities have become so coarsened by the glare, what I call the glare of, of electroluminescence. And then I also emphasize that the whole um, industrialization, the industrial production of dyes and other color mm-hmm. artificial color, was totally bound up in the in the in the huge chemical companies, the conglomerates that emerged. I mean, that you know, everyone knows the, the German company IG Farben, but people who don't know German don't realize that that word is called. You know, they're, they're one of the most notorious chemical companies that's bound up in all the horrors of World War II it was a company that started out making artificial color. <laughs> the, 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 I'm not sure if you know the work of the anthropologist uh, Marshall Salins, who taught at University of Chicago for, for many years. He died um, a year or two ago. Actually, you know, one of his great books was the book called Stone Age Economics, which refuted all of the sort of classical economic theories that... that um, showed primitive societies to being, you know, de- de- societies of deprivation, impoverishment. And he, he, he was showing how what, what were called primitive peoples, in fact, led these incredibly rich um, material and social existences. But anyway, a book that was published posthumously, was a, it, it had the word enchantment in the title, which I found fascinating. Um, and the subtitle of the book was An Anthropology of most of humanity. So in other words, he was he was associating the whole phenomena of enchantment with most of humanity. Um, and it, so the, 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 one of the, the implications of the book is, is how extreme the last 200 years are in terms of an aberration, of a departure from thousands and thousands and thousands of years of the way human beings have lived together. So there again, it's a, you know, uh, it's a, it's a way of thinking about um, you know what what exactly is here to stay, <laughs> you know. But it's also a thing about what, what's recoverable from 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 thinking about what would a new understanding of 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 an enchanted relationship to the to the world be, and I you know I'm you know I, I, I I'm I'm wary. I, I mean, there are a lot of ways in which people talk about enchantment that I'm 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 not comfortable with but I but I also think that it, it's it's an essential way of thinking about alternative ways of living um living with other people and living with you know with the other species and the the the, the living components of of the planet yeah i i think there is some form of hope because to your point about sleep or just what is ingrained in us and what is required Mm-hmm. for our bodies to sustain themselves. You have millions of years of evolution, you know, hundreds of thousands of years being Homo sapiens and just that idea of like there is this weight of history that has shaped us and that not all is lost, I don't think. I think we can get some of that back. The analogy I, I think of is maybe like an abusive relationship where someone sort of takes you in and makes them your world uh, or you're their world or whatever. And then, you know, you can come out of that in a bit of a haze, like, okay, yeah, I need to sort of reconnect <laughs> with reality. And I sort of see the maybe the corporate capitalism as just a very sort of abusive relationship that tells people what that they think they want or need, but just doesn't right. deliver anything satisfying. Yeah, that, I think that's a great formulation. Now and again, I'll say something smart. So I'm happy that that <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, in just in terms of sort of wrapping up, sorry, Ikoi, did you have any sort of final thoughts? Because there's a great quote that I wanted to end on be, because I thought it nailed everything. Well, you know, being a substance use counselor, you know, the book reminded me of a quote, a quote by Dr. Gabor Mate, which is the more pain you cause people, the more shame and isolate, the more you shame and isolate them, the worse they'll, they'll feel about themselves. If you wanted to design a system to maintain drug use and enhance the profits of the illegal drug trade, I would design the system you have. And it <laughs> definitely <laughs> reminded me of, of some of your critiques of the internet. Uh, no. Yeah, that's great. Not to overquote things. I can always cut this bit out, but um, it's remarkable that a moment of unparalleled danger for the future of the planet, for the very survival of human and animal life, that so many people should voluntarily confine themselves in the desiccated digital closets devised by a handful of sociocidal corporations. Pathways to a different world will not be found by internet search engines. Yeah, I thought that was... Uh, yeah, instructive. And, you know, you do you do point to some community solutions. You know, you say, <laughs> I mean, again, the corporate the corporate world has made the meeting the sort of bane of everyone's existence. But you say, you know, the meeting, whether that's a town hall or just a group of people mm -hmm. getting together is inescapable. Like it is the precondition for any sort of human connection. Yeah. Um, and you do talk about various different examples of just sort of direct democracy in town meeting halls and mm -hmm. actually just getting face to face that, you know, that is, that's the way out of this. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, otherwise I wouldn't be writing the books. I'm writing. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> it's about looking forward. It's about looking ahead. Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Alex Placito, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Jennifer Cox, Rebecca Johns, Seamus O'Connell, Sheena Belmas, and Ethan. If you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And you can hear more from Harriet on her radio show called Update. It's on Wednesday afternoons and in the WBAI archives.